book of Daniel chapter number 2 and verse 21 says this verse. I think it's a great portion of Scripture really to, to think about. The Bible says, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. I think that's an important thing to remember in all of life, and I think particularly in this time in the life of our church, that God oftentimes changes the seasons. Uh, you notice the emphasis there that He raises up kings and He puts down kings, and that's exactly what we read in our text. He had raised up Saul, and now He had put Saul aside. And now He was about to raise up David to be the next king of the people of God. You know, the truth is tonight that change is a part of life, isn't it? I wish really sometimes that change wasn't a part of life, but really change is a constant in our life. Life is always changing. Uh, do you have photo albums at home? Now you just go on Facebook and go through your photos online. But do you ever go through your photos and remember how you used to be? <laughs> you laugh about your old hairstyles or the hairstyles that you've clung on to for years and people go, why are you still wearing that? My, my dad his whole life long has had a has had a flat top. I think if he changed it now, I wouldn't know who he was. Uh, but he's had it his whole life, my whole life knowing him. That's all he's had. He's had a mustache pretty much his whole life long. He shaved it once when I was in the fifth grade, and he picked me up from school, and I almost refused to get in the truck with him. I said, you're not my dad. You don't look anything like my dad. I'm not going with you. And it was so awkward when I'd been around him that long, and he shaved his mustache. You know, the truth is, is we wish that we could all stay the same. Sometimes we wish that places and times would stay the same forever. Now maybe there's a time in your life that you remember and you're like, this is the best part of my life, and you really wish you could bottle that up and save it forever. You wish it could always be that way, but it seems like the longer that I live, and I think many of you can testify to that, the longer that you've lived, the more we understand that if there's one constant in life, it's that life seems to change. People you love and wish were always around, some of them aren't here anymore. Some of them have passed away. Some of them have moved away. Some of them have moved on. And we wish that things could always stay the same. We wish that we could stay the same. We wish our waist could stay the same size. or Our hair would stay where it's supposed to be. And our eyesight would be how it always was. Some of us wish that we still had the stamina that we used to. But the truth is, Things naturally change. There's going to be changing in all of our lives. But here's the truth that I think we should remember in all of this. That in all of this change that goes on in life, God's desire is that He changes us. Even though we are naturally going to go through change, and day after day, moment to moment, year after year, we are going to experience change in our life, God's desire is that He changes us. And more specifically, what is His purpose in changing us? It is to be more like Him. God uses change to really bring about change if we recognize and use it for that. And as we already mentioned in our text, Saul had been rejected as king, and Samuel's job was to anoint the next king of the children of Israel. And there's several things that I want to just draw out from this passage that I hope will be a help to us in this time in the life of our church, and maybe even help to you personally. I don't know what you're dealing with tonight. Maybe you're dealing with some personal change. Maybe there's some situations going on in your life that are changing, that seemingly are out of your control. And I want to comfort you and challenge you with a few things from God's Word this evening. Here's the first. I want us to consider tonight three areas where we need to stay right during seasons of change. There's going to be times when things change, and there are going to be seasons of change. So how do we stay right during those seasons of change? What are some areas where we need to stay right? Here's the first one. We, we, we must stay right in our attitude. We just got to stay right in our attitude. Look at verse number one again. Notice what the Lord tells Samuel the prophet here. What does he say? He says, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? Samuel was having a hard time with getting over Saul. You have to understand something particular about this, that Samuel was heavily involved in the selection of Saul. God led him to this man Saul. He was also involved in the anointing of Saul. And he was also involved counseling Saul and telling him what the Lord said. And now, 
Now that God had removed Saul as part of his plan for his people, Samuel had a hard time with that. In essence, Samuel had put all of his eggs in Saul's basket, and I don't know if he felt some personal remorse because he felt like, I've been involved in this, and I've helped guide this man, and now he's gone astray. We, astray. we have to understand that Saul, I, or excuse me, Samuel, I believe, loved Saul. I believe he cared about him. I believe he wanted him to do right and follow the Lord, but we remember the account where he rejected to do things God's way. He offered up this offering, and he said, well, the people made me to do it, and the Philistines were gathered. I had no choice to do this. And what does Samuel say? To obey is better than sacrifice. Hey, he, he disobeyed God. He came back, and he was supposed to slaughter everything, and he had sheep and all of these things. And he said, what's this bleeding that I hear? If you already obeyed God to the fullest, why do I hear these things? To obey is better than sacrifice. And you see Samuel here, he's all stirred up, and he's, he's consumed with Saul, and God tells him, how long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? You know, it's been said that attitude controls altitude. I think that's a neat way to, to understand this, but we do, uh, our life has a lot to do with our perception of it, our attitude that we have. And when change comes our way, we're going we're gonna to have to strive to have the right attitude. You know, the wrong attitude produces some wrong fruit, just like anything in life. When you sow to the wrong things, it'll bring forth the wrong fruit. When you have the wrong attitude, it's going to lead to things like grumbling and complaining. It's going to lead to criticizing and discontentment and distrust and disunity. All those things come from really having the wrong attitude. I want us to remember tonight that our attitude can do a great deal to either help or hurt during a time of change. Maybe you're going through a change. Your attitude has a lot to do with that. I think as husbands and wives, we need to remember that, that our attitudes as a spouse has a great deal of influence to our, our, our spouses. Uh, I, I think my wife could testify to that. If I've had an idea and I think it's great and she thinks it's stupid, um, it deflates my balloon a little bit. <laughs> I began to think, you're probably right, I'm sorry, I, I, that was dumb, you know? And sometimes out of spite, I might just intend to do it anyway, because I think, well, I'm right, you're wrong, nana, nana, boo, boo, I'm going to do it anyway. The truth is, is that our attitude has a lot to do with either hurting or helping during times of change. I think if you looked at this passage, Samuel's attitude was really holding him back where God wanted, wanted to take him and what God wanted to use him to do. He was, he was, he was being held back because he was so, so mournful of Saul. And God was trying to encourage him, hey, my plan is not derailed because Saul disobeyed me. And I'm thankful for that, that God's plan and His work doesn't come and go with certain people. I'm glad, and that's a good place to say amen, by the way, but I'm glad that God's work doesn't rest on one individual. I'm glad that it doesn't rest on a certain group or one church only. I'm glad that God's work will always be done, and God's going to see that His work is done. But here's the emphasis. We need to be willing and wanting to get in on that work. And unless we have the right attitude and really strive to maintain the right attitude, we're really going to be hung up and not involved on the work God wants to do in and through us. It's during seasons of change that there's a great opportunity to develop a wrong attitude. And Samuel's a great example of that. Something happened, he wasn't expecting it, there was a change going on in the nation, and he develops a, really the wrong attitude that he should have. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says this, "...in everything give thanks." Now, I agree with that when good stuff happens. But when things happen I really don't prefer and change takes place, it's hard for me to implement that verse. But that's really what the Bible's saying. In everything, give thanks. Why, why should we do that? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, he says. So what do we do when change takes place, when there's a season of change? Well, by faith, we need to ask God, God, help me to have and maintain the right attitude. Give me an attitude of gratitude. Did you know that gratitude rejects criticism? I mean, do you, do you understand that? That it, negativity is really the opposite of being positive. And if you're thankful and glad and really asking God, say, God, thank you for this and thank you for bringing this my way. And I know this isn't how I would have planned it, but I really thank you for causing this change to take place because I understand biblically you want to change me to be more like you. When you're, when you're expressing gratitude over certain things, it, it's hard to have 
criticism come out of the same mouth. In fact, that's what the Bible encourages. He said, hey, blessings and cursings can sometimes come out of the same mouth. And what's the admonition there? Uh, hey, these things ought not so to be. Uh, choose which way you're going to go. And if we're constantly back and forth, we're not going to really progress and move forward. I think as a church, especially during this time in our in our life and in the, 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 the life and ministry of our church, we need to be grateful for the men God has led our way in the past. The pastors that we have uh, enjoyed and seen God use to invest in our lives. We're not, we're not erasing anybody's history, and, and even sometimes there may be some things in the history of this church that you, you'd maybe prefer to forget, or I don't really think that was handled the right way, but the truth is, is that every part of that was part of God's plan, and He can use those things to bring about good for us. And we need to be grateful for the time. Listen, one of the things that I think God's dealing with me about as, as a 30-something-year-old man is that we need to be grateful for the time God gives us with certain people. I'm learning that sometimes people come into our life just when we need them and when God wants to use them, and we wish they would always be around, but sometimes they're gone. Sometimes they pass off the scene just like her when we were talking about that. They come out of nowhere, and they're there, and they do a work, and God uses them, and then it's seemingly like they're they're gone. Where did they go? But the truth is, we need to be grateful for what God did in our life while they were there. That's why we need to ask God, use us, because who knows if we're the person God wants to use for such a time as this in someone else's life. What do you thank God for the blessings He's given us at this church? Hey, the people who serve and that we serve with, do you understand that it, it, it's, it's so easy to, to be critical of somebody in this church when we stop thanking God for one another? When we start using words like this, well, they and that crowd and those people. Hey, last time I checked, it's all about we and us because we're one body. We're one church. We're all together in this. We can't start dividing and splitting. We're there in that camp and they're over here and they're this. and they're that. That's not the point. God said we're, we're his church. We're his body. We're one in Christ. So what should we do? We should be grateful for one another. Hey, some of you might be, as the, as the scripture says, some of you might be the ear. Some of you might be the mouth. Some of you might be the stinky feet. I don't know. But every part is needful. And we're all part of the same body. And we need to work at maintaining the right attitude. Hey, when there's seasons of change that comes, and there's always going to be those times, things are always going to change. So what's going to help me and you respond the right way? We have to strive to keep the right attitude. God, thank you. I don't understand everything. I don't know why you're doing it the way that you're doing it. But thank you for being at work in my life. Thank you for being at work in the life of our church. You understand that sometimes things will always stay the same in certain places, but there's other places where they're going through change. You know what we need to recognize, especially at this time in our church? God, thank you that you're at work. We're looking at you to work. Guide us. Make this change change me into what you want me to be. Use this change to change us as a church into what you want us to be. Not only that we need to stay right in our attitude, but look at the second thing. We need to stay right in our actions. I said this to our staff, and I, I know it's true. I've seen this in my own life and seen this in the lives of other people, but seasons of change will always reveal a person's character. Seasons of change will always reveal a person's character. Some view change as an opportunity to work out their own agenda. You even see that historically when, you know, when people aren't in their place or uh, some, some member of a royal family becomes sick, somebody will start using that to usurp the throne or to take over or take control. Or, you know, when anytime there's like a change in authority, sometime that they'll do that. And if we're not careful as a church, that's a temptation for some people. That when there's no direct authority, when there's no pastor per se where they ought to be, that people start working their own agendas or they start doing their own thing. And that's why a church needs a pastor. That's another good place to say amen. A church needs a pastor. I've heard people say, well, it seems like everything's going good. I don't even know if we need one. Yeah, we do, because that's how God intended for it to be. Whether I agree with it or not sometimes, whether you agree with it or not, and you're like, oh, everything's going good. No, a church needs a pastor. Why? That's what God intended for it to have. He said He gifted the church with certain things. And one of them is a pastor. Someone who He had given a heart to lead His people toward Him. 
and knit the heart of those people with that man together going after God. Man, seasons of change is always going to reveal a person's character. Some, sometimes people use it as a time for laziness. They slack off. They, they don't do things as much as they used to do. They, they just sort of feel like, well, there's nobody out in front to recognize me or whatever the case might be. But people seem to change their behavior when they go through a season of change, not just in a church, but even individually. People who used to be faithful to church, there's something happens in their life, and now you don't know where they are. They're not in God's house anymore. They're not where they normally are. And they, well, I'm just going through some things right now. What they mean is there's some changes going on, and I want to encourage you tonight that there's always going to be some times of change, some seasons of change, and what do we need to do? We need to stay right in our actions. Look at verse number 1 again. God tells Samuel, fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. Can I, can I tell you that I love this aspect and this principle found in God's Word, that God always knows what he's doing. You notice the emphasis that he puts there? He said, I have provided me a king among his sons. God already knows what he's doing. Samuel had no idea. He didn't know who was going to be the next king, but God knew. Can I remind our church tonight, you may not know who the next pastor is going to be, but God knows. He already knows. He already has it all figured out. He already knows his plan, exactly how it ought to be. Just because I don't know, and maybe you don't know, doesn't mean that God's in there with you and me saying, I don't know either. Let's figure this out together. God knows what he's doing. I want you to see a couple of things in regards to our action that we need to trust God in spite of our fears. Look at verse number two. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're as fearful as Samuel was, but I think he had good argument here. He knew Saul, and he knew what this guy could do. And he said, if he knows I'm going to anoint another king, buddy, I'm a dead man. God, I don't know if you know this at all, but if I go and Saul finds out, you're, I'm going to see you face to face. <laughs> Where we can talk about it in person. His natural response to this change was fear. And can I tell you, that's exactly what happens with you and me. When change comes into our life, the natural knee-jerk response is to be afraid. I don't have all the answers. I don't know. And naturally, I'm going to be afraid. I don't want to do that. I don't want anything to do that. I want everything to stay the same. We get in our little bubble, and we just want everything to be like it's always been. And our natural response is fear. And I tell you that fear is a powerful thing. Did you know that fear will cause us to do things we shouldn't do? And it will also hinder us from doing things we ought to do. There's times when growing up when my mom and dad would say, I want you to take out the trash. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And I waited too long and it got dark. I don't mean city dark. I'm not talking about Long Beach dark where it's still light enough you can play golf maybe. I don't know. But I'm just saying it was so dark. I mean, you just knew the boogeymen were out. And our porch light was bright, but it wasn't that as bright as I wanted. I mean, I wanted it bright enough so you could barbecue, you know, hot dogs. I, I wanted it to be bright. And I remember getting that bag of trash and opening up the back door, and, and, and it was one of those that had the spring that made it shut. And my dad had wound it so tight that it didn't take long to shut once you went, mm, it went, Pff. So I had to work it out. I would, I would put my foot in there, and I would lean as far out. And, and, you know, the trash can is way over. It seemed like if it was 100 miles, that's what it was. And I remember as a little boy that I'd say, are you taking that trash out? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, I'm working on it. <laughs> you better do it. And what would happen? Say, I would, I'd let go of that door, <laughs> and I'd throw in the trash, and sure enough, wham! And I knew that the second that that door shut, every monster and creature and alien that I'd ever heard about, read about, or even thought about was just waiting around the corners of my home to snatch me up. That's one of the reasons when I was younger, I tried to gain weight. I knew that if I was heavier, it would be a little harder to either swallow me or carry me off. I'm still working on that. You don't see many people trying to kidnap me, do you? It's working. So, But I just remember that you say, why did you act that way? I'm sure if I went back in time and saw myself, I would laugh so hard and then go, you dummy. <laughs> There's nothing out there. <laughs> Some stray cat. That's the only thing making those noises. <laughs> And we laugh when we see people do things. We laugh at people that react a certain way, maybe to a riot that they're terrified of or 
something that goes on in their life. I know for a long time in my life I was terrified of water. Never learned how to swim until I was in my teen years. And people make fun of me. I can learn to, you know, I learned to swim at the YMCA and enjoyed it. But I'm just saying that fear will make you do some pretty crazy stuff sometimes. Fear will make you respond in ways that you shouldn't. And the truth is that there's times when God tells us to do things, but because we're afraid, they hold us back from doing the right things that we ought to do. One of the verses, I used to be afraid of the dark, and I'll never forget this. One of the verses early on in my life that my mother taught me was Psalm 56.3. What time I am afraid, I'll trust in thee. I'll tell you that in, in the middle of my bed at night, there's many a time that I yelled out to monsters and things. What time I'm afraid, I'm trusting in you, God. You need to come down and deal with this. Hey, all joking aside, if you're afraid because there's some change going on, can I encourage you with God's Word? What time I'm afraid, I'll trust in Thee. May God help us to use change to drive us to Him. Not away, not to be timid, not to be afraid, but to drive us to Him. Not only do we need to, in spite of our fears, trust in the Lord, but we need to also obey God each step of the way. Look at verse number 3. God, the Lord tells Samuel, I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And as we journey this journey of faith, here's what you and I like to do. We want to know every path that we're going to take. We want to know every bend along the way. We want to know every pit stop that God has planned. We want to know the route and how long it's going to take and approximately maybe everything that we're going to need while we're on that journey. But can I remind all of us, that's not the way that God works. God is not a, from beginning to ending charting out your path. In fact, my Bible teaches me that God is a God that leads us each step at a time. In fact, what does He say about our needs, about our supply? He said, He'll give us this day our daily bread. What we need when we need it, that's how God loves to provide. One step after another step after another step. That is the way God loves to lead. There's a constant dependence on Him. If we knew the path, we'd say, see you later, God. I'll get with you when I reach a spot where I need you again. But God's desire for my life and yours and even for the life of our church is not a yearly, yearly, yearly walk. Or a decade after decade after decade walk. Or not when you have your first child and then your second one comes along and then your third and fourth child. No, his desire is that day by day, moment by moment, step by step, we obey him along the way. God wanted Samuel to understand, you don't need to know everything. All you need to know is what's next. What's next? That frustrates me so many times. I think if you're honest, that would frustrate you that God is a God from one step to the next step. And when we get hung up on one step because of fear or because of our past or because of our attitude, do you understand that? That we are holding up God's progression of our faith. We, we are holding up what God wants us to do because He's not leading us on this one long journey, but it's moment by moment, step by step. We're to obey Him. What did He tell Samuel? Grab your horn of oil. Go here, and when you get there, I'll tell you what to do and who to anoint. We need to remember that. Not, not that long ago, a few nights ago, I was, uh, one of my children said, Dad, would you draw me a picture? And I told him, I said, well, I don't want to just draw things for you all the time. What if, what if we drew something together? And I said, what you need to do is get your piece of paper on your side, and I'll get my piece of paper on my side, and once I make a line, I want you to make the same line. And we did this, say, how long did it take? Longer than I wanted it to take. <laughs> I, realized one of, I realized that he was more of a perfectionist than I wanted him to be, and he'd make it, and it wasn't quite straight. He went, I was like, no, don't worry about it. Come on, man, let's, let's just keep going. I don't want to spend half the night drawing some stick person, you know. But we, we drew this little picture together, and I just loved seeing his face because I would draw a line, and he'd draw a line. I'd draw a circle, and he'd draw something that looked like a circle to him, and it was... It was one after one, one another, one another. And you know, when we got done, we got done at the same time. 
And he was so excited to show mom, look at the picture that I drew. And you say, well, he didn't really draw that picture. You drew it. No, I was showing him what to do, and he was following me step by step. And I want to tell you that some of the most complicated things, if I sat down with somebody or they sat down with me, even the most complicated of artistic works could, it's possible that you could accomplish the same thing if you were following somebody step by step by step. And I'll tell you that that's how God wants to lead you and me. He's not showing you the grand masterpiece and going, all right, do that. No, what is he doing? Draw this line. Well, God, I, that's boring. I want to do line 58. He said, no, start right here. Good job. Now let's do this line next. A little bit different. Oh, watch out now. We're going to do an oval. Whoa. I put a little dot in there. What good is that? Just wait, and you're going to see how it turns out. And I want to tell you that there's changes that take place in our life that seem so complicated. There's so many things that, that are involved in it. It's, it's everywhere. I don't even know where to start, God. Look at all of this swirling here and there and everywhere. And, 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 and I'm asking you to do something to this, but look at this. Look how complex and complicated it is. But God says, don't, don't worry about all that. Here's what you need to worry about. Start right here. Step one. Step two. Step three. Whoa, wait a second. Step three. Step three. Good job. Step four. And I tell you, if we are going to have God do what He wants to do in seasons of change, we are going to have to obey Him step by step by step. Hey, some of you might be saying, I wish we already had a pastor by now. Can I tell you? That's not our next step. God's taking us the next step. Oh, that's coming. That's what he wants, by the way. That's, that's his goal, too. Don't forget about that. That's what he wants for you and me, too. But wait, we're not to that step yet. We're at this step. And God said, I want you to follow me step by step by step. I want you to show you the third thing. We need to stay right in our assessment. I want to ask you this question tonight. How do you view seasons of change? What do you think about that? How do you view when change comes along? Do you see it as a problem to be fixed? Can I confess to you that a lot of times that's the first way I see change? This is a problem to be corrected. This is something that needs to be fixed. There's a hole now. I've got to fill that hole with something, with someone. I've got to fix this. Or do we, instead of seeing it as a problem to be fixed, do we actually see it as an opportunity for God to work? Because Samuel, when he saw this in his life, this change that came along, he saw it as a problem to be fixed. How do we know that? Because I want you to notice the first thing about this idea of having the right assessment, that we don't need to be blinded by our own desires. Look at verse number 6. Samuel, The Bible's talking about Samuel here. It says, he looked on Eliab and said, surely, and notice that word, surely, he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. He was absolutely certain about this. He said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But I want us to back up a little bit and be reminded that what was going on in Saul's life was exactly what happened in, in Saul's life. Samuel's life was now mimicking the life of Saul, the man who had rejected God and went his own way, and now God had judged him and rejected him as being king. Samuel, the man of God, was now being tempted to do exactly what Saul had done. He was being blinded by his own desires. In other words, this is what happened when Samuel looked at all these guys. The first guy that stood out to him was Eliab. Because remember, in, with Saul, Saul was a head taller than everybody else in Israel. The man looked the part. He was handsome. He was, I believe he was bulked up a little bit. The guy had known hard labor and work. I believe that he had some character about him. This was a guy that when you looked at him, you thought, that is the guy that you need to be king. And here's what happened. Samuel, on the outside looking in, said, if there's anybody that's of the stock of Jesse that's going to be the next king, it's that guy. Done deal, God. Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Hey, just tell me when to pour, Lord. <laughs> and here's the thing. 
That was Samuel's pick, but guess what? It wasn't God's pick. And God actually shares a great lesson with Samuel. Because God, God's Word tells us that God's ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are not our thoughts. And notice what it says there in verse number 7. Look not on His countenance, or on the height of His stature, because I have refused Him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for a man, for a man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And let me take a time out right here because what some people like to do is they like to take this verse and say, see, it doesn't matter to God how you look. It doesn't matter to God what's on the outside. It doesn't matter to God about any of that because God sees my heart. Some people use this verse and they really mistreat the principle God's trying to teach us. Well, it doesn't matter what goes on the outside. God knows my heart, preacher. God knows what's going on on the inside. And they say that like that's their way to get out of whatever they do or however they behave. But the truth is, God is not negating the importance of the outside. He's saying, hey, the outside is important because everybody sees that. You see that. I see that. But here's where he goes further. He said, don't get so enthralled and consumed with the outside that you forget that there's a lot more to a person than just the exterior. There's the inner person. There's the inner man. And what, is, what did he say? That's what I see. In fact, I believe that's where he began his basis. How do we know that? Because the man he was sending Samuel to anoint, God said he's a man after my own heart. Now, there was a lot of great things going on the outside of David. That's how we know that it wasn't God saying, oh, I want him to be ugly, have no talent, no natural gifts and ability. He's just got a really good personality and a heart to please me. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, that's not the first place I look. That's not the first place I go. That's not the things that attract me to people. And Samuel had to learn a great lesson that he was falling prey to what led Saul astray. He was letting the exterior, the superficial, be the first thing. And God said, no, that's not the first thing. The first thing is their heart. We need to understand that the Lord is not distracted by appearance or perception. That He's aware of the things that are going on inside, not only of others, but of ourself. Man, I got convicted looking over this because we do such a good job of that, don't we? We dress up and we look the part and we want everybody to think a certain way about us, but the truth is, God says, that doesn't distract me. That's great if you're looking sharp and you, you're healthy and you take care of your body, but God says, the most important thing to me is your heart. Where's your heart? Because for whatever reason, and we're not told in Scripture, for whatever reason, Eliab looked the part. But God said, I saw his heart, and he's not the one I want. I want to tell you, if God came in to this auditorium tonight, and he looked at you, and he looked at me, would he say, I'll, I'll take them? Or would he look at our heart and say, you know what? No. I'm going to look for another. And can you imagine Jesse? Not just one of his sons, but the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. If I was Samuel, I'd probably be getting disheartened about the, the last one that came through the line. I would have probably said, Lord, maybe we missed something here because you said, <laughs> go to Jesse's house and I'm going to tell you the guy to anoint him. And he's, he's fresh out of him, God. <laughs> I want you to understand that when it comes to the Lord, let's not get distracted by the externals. Hey, in the life of our church, we all have preferences. We all have things that we like. But let's not get so wrapped up in the things we would prefer to have that we forget about what God wants for us. We forget about what God sees and how God leads I want you to show you the last thing here in regards to our assessment. We don't, we don't need to set limits on what God can do. Look at verse number 11. Are here all thy children, Samuel said? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him. <laughs> Man, I like that. Samuel wasn't messing around. <laughs> You know, I could see Jesse going, well, there's the youngest, and he's keeping the herd today, the flock. And he says, go fetch him. Go get him. 
for we will not sit down till he come hither. And I remind us tonight that God knew who was going to be the next king, but really nobody else did. Not Jesse, not Samuel. The truth is, not even David. Nobody knew but the Lord. And out of all the choices that were before Samuel, guess what? The Lord picked none of them. He picked one nobody else knew about. And I think that's very interesting because sometimes we think we know all the pieces. Sometimes we think we have it all figured out. The truth is we don't have it all figured out. We think we can see it all in the whole spectrum, and I know everything that's going on. And so because of everything else in our universe goes that way, we begin to make our own plans, and we think certain things, and we begin to figure things out. Maybe you've got a need in your home, and you begin to say, well, here's all the pieces to this, and I know if I can just sort them a certain way, I can figure this all out. It could just be God knows some options you're not aware of. It could just be God knows some avenues of some places of service that you don't know anything about yet. Why? Because you're following step by step by step by step. And when you do that, God will be limited if we think all he has to pick from is what we know about. God knows so much more than you or I do. It reminds me of that show. What's that show, The uh, Let's Make a Deal, is that it, when they showed you the doors? Door number one. Or you can pick behind what's door number two. Or you can pick door number three and they play the music and then, oh, oh me, oh my, which one am I going to pick? Or you're going to keep the money. And people would make the choice. Can I tell you that that's sort of the setup that happened with Samuel. Who are you going to pick? Are you going to pick Eliab? Are you going to pick Shammah? Who's going to be your pick? And guess what? God didn't say one, two, or three. God said, I want door number four. Whoa, I didn't even know that was an option. God said, I knew. I knew exactly where it was and what was inside. Can I tell you that God will use things that we wouldn't choose to accomplish His purpose. Why? So that He gets the honor and glory. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27-30 through 30 says, But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the world, and things which are despised that God chosen you and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in His presence. So can I ask you tonight, have you limited God in an area of your life? Have you said, you know what, God, it's got to be this or this. Can I tell you, let's not be as foolish as His people were because that's one of the things that God said they did in the wilderness. They limited God. They shortened His arm. They said God can only go here or here, stretch here or here, do this and this. They even did it with... With Jesus Christ. They laughed him to scorn, the Bible said. He, she's dead. What are you doing here now? Lazarus is dead. They, he went into the young, young maiden. They were laughing at him. What are you doing? No, call everybody out. It's not over with. I know an option you don't even know about. Oh, Lazarus is dead. He even stinks. What are you talking about? And he raised him from the dead. Why? Because God is not bound by the things you and I are bound by. He doesn't play by the same rules of our scope and our reality. There is no impossibility, boundary, or limit to God. Everything is on the table for Him and at His disposal, and He is willing to use all of it at any time for His particular purposes. I want to tell you, as human beings, I am so guilty of limiting God in my life. God, you can only do this. And God said, if you only knew what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it and the way you wanted me to do it. And at the end of it all, the times of my life that I look back and I go, look, the only way that happened was God. Do you know what? He planned it that way. That's how he always intended for it to be because he didn't want anybody to step back and say, look what I did to help God out. He always wants somebody to say, look what God did. You know what God wants for our church? He wants people to look at the testimony and the life and the ministries here and the only thing they can say about First Baptist Church is God did that. God changed that person's life. God enabled that person to serve. Hey, God led that man to be the next pastor. That's what God wants. Sometimes when we can figure it all out in our own little way, it's because we've left God out of it. Because God desires that if we ever tell the story, we ever tell the account, we ever lead people from point A to the end of the line, it's got to be God all the way through. Only God could do that. Only God could change me. Only God could lead my family. Only God would do that. 
There's no point. There's no rhyme. There's no reason. And when Samuel left the house of Jesse that day, what did he say? God led me to that young man. God picked that boy to be the next king. He wasn't even around. I didn't know anything about him. I just know God wanted me there. And I was ready to do what he led me to do. And when he showed me the next step, what did he do? He took a horn of oil and he anointed the next king of Israel. And at the end of the day, you know what? It was God's idea. Why do we deal with seasons of change? Because God wants to do something in our life. <laughs> Why is our church going through something like this? Because God wants to change us to be more like Him that more glory might be directed to Him. <laughs> that we can do more work for Him. Let me ask you tonight, how's your attitude? Have you been guilty of complaining about some change in your life or in the life of our church? May God help us to develop an attitude of gratitude. God, thank You. Thank You. You want more for us than we want for ourselves. Thank you. How are you acting tonight? Are you using the season of change to stagnate or to grow? Are you allowing God to use that to produce more from your lives or consume it on what you want, how you want it? And what's your assessment? Have you already made up your mind based on what you see? You already determined that's how it's got to be. I want to encourage you. Let's not limit God. Let's not limit God because nothing's off limits to Him. Anything, anywhere, God will use those things to perform His purpose. Now, that's my sermon tonight. 